I should record it. <clears throat> we have for the kidneys, if we just look at them in this picture on a macroscopic scale, we have an outer layer called the cortex. And this entire inner layer here is the adrenal medulla. I'm oh, sorry, not the adrenal medulla. The medulla of the kidney. Still have adrenal glands on my mind. Um, so that's the medulla. That means the middle. Each kidney has uh, these regular systems that are look like an inverse pyramid, and so they are called renal pyramids. They are striated because of these tube-like structures that are going through the medulla. At the tip of each pyramid is a little nipple-like anatomical feature, and that little nipple is called a papilla. And from the papilla drips urine into other structures found on the kidney. I'm going to erase some of this so I can So these other structures that the renal papilla drip urine into, these tiny structures right here that I'm highlighting in blue are called minor calyxes. And the minor calyxes converge into larger major calyxes. A hilum is an indented region like this on the kidney where things can enter and exit the kidney. What would enter? Uh, the renal artery bringing blood to the kidney. What would exit? The renal vein and the ureter, which is an extension of the renal pelvis shown up here, this funnel shaped structure. <clears throat> Other things that could be entering and exiting would be nerves and lymphatic vessels. A renal column, well, a renal column, a renal column is shown here. Let me get a different color. A renal column here is the extension of the cortex in between the pyramids. So that's a renal column. And then these renal columns basically separate the kidney into lobes. So a lobe would be an entire pyramid plus the cortex and surrounding column. So how many lobes do we see on this kidney in this picture? We see one, two, three, four, five, six lobes of the kidney. Here is a picture of a human kidney. And again, you can see the outer layer, cortex. The whole internal layer is the medulla. We also see that the medulla is arranged in these pyramids. And we see extensions of the columns or renal columns, extension of the cortex in between the pyramids, dividing everything into lobes. So here is a lobe. Here is another lobe. Here is another lobe. You get the idea. The minor calyces, I'm going to highlight in blue. These minor calyces collect the urine dripping out of the renal papilla from each of the pyramids. So these minor calyces will then converge into a major calyx. And here's another major calyx. And then those major calyces converge to form this structure, the renal pelvis, and it's a funnel shaped structure. Finally, the renal pelvis will exit and turns into the ureter. 
and the ure ureter is going to carry urine from the kidney where it was made to the bladder where it is stored until socially acceptable to, to release yourself. And that's called micturition. That's the proper name for peeing, micturition. <clears throat> Blood going to the kidney. There's definitely a pathway. And I would be ready to know this pathway for your lecture exam. Blood enters the kidney through the renal artery. Then it branches. Some textbooks say that first it branches into lobular, lobular uh, branches going to the different lobes. Um, some just say directly they go to segmental arteries. Um, so I, I'm going to pretty much stick with this, this picture that the renal artery goes to segmental arteries. Um, technically, low bar, lo, uh, lobular arteries are in here. Technically, uh, some of you are using a textbook that I might not be using. That's why I'm addressing it. Um, let me put this in proper place. And let me redo that. Um, if you have a textbook <clears throat> that has lob, lo, keep wanting to say lobular, low bar arteries, your textbook probably puts low bar arteries here. They should precede interlobar arteries. Interlobar arteries, as their name says, they are going in between the lobes. They travel through the renal columns specifically. Then we have an artery that goes over the base of the pyramid and it arcs around. So that is called an arcuate artery. Then we have little finger-like extensions from the arcuate artery into the cortex. This is again where your textbook might give you something different. Interlobular artery. Some textbooks have taken that term out and they call it a cortical radiant. artery. Um, I use the term cortical radiant artery. Here's why. Interlobar artery and interlobular artery, as you just heard previously me getting tongue-tied between those, sound dangerously similar to each other and it invites confusion especially if your book does have a flow chart that includes lobar arteries. So again, renal artery, segmental to lobar, if your textbook shows that the, that's in the flow chart, to interlobar, to arcuate. After that, I will stick with cortical radiant artery. I will not use interlobular artery. So here, shown up, oops, shown more up close. My computer is jittery today. More up close, here is that, that arcuate artery and this finger-like extension artery coming up would be the cortical radiant that I just told you about. And then it's going to branch into an artery going into this capillary. Anything that's going into something, we learned from last unit means afferent, incoming. So an afferent arterial leads to a glomerulus, which is a very specialized capillary. It is a fenestrated capillary. And then we don't see a venule after that capillary. Instead, we see another arterial, an arterial that's exiting from the glomerulus. And that exiting arterial is called an efferent arterial. Then the efferent arterial leads to a second capillary bed shown here, all intertwined and wrapped around a structure. 
in the kidney called the nephron. So the peritubular capillary bed, peritubular capillary bed is a second capillary and that means the kidneys have a portal system. They have a double capillary bed, but it comes first from an arterial and then it leads to another arterial with the glomerulus in between. And then after that arterial, we get the peritubular capillary bed. So this is an arterial portal system. We also saw a portal system when we learned about the hepatic portal system, but that was a venous portal system. This is an arterial portal system. Then the blood will exit from the peritubular capillary bed. It will exit through an interlobular vein to an arcuate vein. Again, the arcuate vessels go around the base, the widest part of the renal pyramid. Then that turns into an interlobar vein, again, going in between the lobes. And for veins, there is no lobar nor segmental vein. We go straight from the interlobar vein into the renal vein. So again, segmental vein, lobar veins do not exist. We go straight from interlobar to renal vein, which would then dump into the inferior vena cava. When we speak of kidney function, um, First of all, we do measure kidney function every day in a clinical setting. If you have ever had blood or urine analysis done, and arguably most of you have, you get pages of data back from the doctor's office telling you if your red blood cell count is normal or your white blood cell count is normal. But also in the pages of data that you are getting, there is a section where they have measured your renal function. And they estimate this. This estimation of your renal function is called estimated glomerular filtration rate. You see, if the kidneys are going to do their job at all, which means to sift through your plasma and remove waste products and reabsorb salts and waters to make sure they don't end up in the toilet. They're not part of your urine. Things that are precious, the kidneys should save. In order for them to do their job, they have to first filter the blood. And the part of blood that is filtered is the plasma. Plasma is about 55% of your whole blood. 45% is your, your red blood cell count, basically, or percentage, I should say. So if you are age 30 or older, congratulations, you are in early stage renal failure. And for every 10 years, so every decade of your life after age 30, you have a 10% decline in renal function. If nothing else kills you in this life, your kidneys will. Ultimately, we will all die of renal failure if nothing else gets us, like this darn coronavirus or a car accident or a cancer. Kidney failure will occur. It's a pretty good way to go, quite frankly, because when the kidneys fail, they cannot remove these waste products that I told you about. And that means your blood pH starts to um, go out of normal range. And when your blood pH goes out of normal range, because of all these waste products accumulating, it affects your neuronal function. You don't uh, behave right. You don't think right. And eventually you slip into a coma and you die. So it's a pretty painless way to go. There's renal function. There's, there's no pain associated with it. Um, you just kind of slip into a coma and, and go sleepy sleepies permanently. So first the kidneys have to filter. Then their job is to keep 
parts of your plasma that are useful to you, that are not waste products. Things like water, sugars, like glucose, amino acids, um, salts like sodium, potassium, calcium. Reabsorption of those salts is going to be variable. That means it depends on your diet. Do you have a high salt diet? Then your kidneys probably are not going to retrieve, reabsorb the salts from the filtrate as much. Let it go to the toilet. You have too much. But maybe you're on a low salt diet, in which case the kidneys will reabsorb the salts from the filtrate and they won't let them go to the toilet. The decision of the kidneys to either reabsorb these salts or not actually is conveyed to them through hormones that I'll tell you about in just a moment. So again, the process starts with filtration. Filtration means you are filtering your blood plasma. The fluid that enters into the beginning part of the nephron, shown here that I'm highlighting in blue in our picture, that fluid is no longer called plasma. It's called filtrate. We can't call it plasma because it's not identical to plasma. It is relatively low in protein compared to plasma. It's a lot like when we learned about the lymphatic system and we said lymph came from plasma, but we shouldn't call it plasma because it's not identical to it. It's the same concept with filtrate. As the filtrate goes through the nephron, the nephron will either reabsorb nutrients or salts and water, again, based on the need of the body for the salts and the water, Maybe you're well hydrated and you don't need to reabsorb as much water. And also some of the waste products and even salts that are in the peritubular capillary bed can be put into the filtrate. When something is going from the peritubular capillary bed into the nephron, into the filtrate, this is called secretion. So these three main processes, these three main functions of the kidney, we measure them, we assess them all the time, um, all the time, and it's not hard to do. We know how to measure filtration rate in patients, how well they reabsorb certain nutrients or salts, and how, what they're secreting, if anything. It's not hard to do. And in physiology, we teach you how they do that. It's, it's actually, it's math. So there are some equations that you're expected to learn. And we teach you how to assess a patient's renal function using these equations. Understand that when you're a nurse, no one is ever going to ask you to do that on the floor when you're working. But if you have a patient that has renal failure, you will be the doctor-patient liaison. That means you will be required to facilitate the doctor's orders, how the doctor is treating the patient, and relay that to the patient so they understand why these treatments are being done. And if it's an issue with kidney function, you're probably going to need to explain the results of these tests. You will be better at explaining the results if you know how they're calculated in the first place. Arguably, it makes you a better nurse. So that's fun math to look forward to in physiology. Nephrons, <clears throat> shown here in peach, these coiled looking structures that I'm gonna put a box around. That entire structure is a nephron. It is the functional unit of a kidney. And whenever we speak of the functional unit of a certain organ, we're talking about this is where 
the nitty gritty, the hard work of the organ can be found. This is where filtration, reabsorption, and secretion happens. You don't have the same kind of nephrons in your kidney. They're not identical. You have the majority of your nephrons are this type called cortical nephrons. Cortical nephrons, I'm going to box in blue, cortical nephrons have most of the nephron in the cortex. That's why they're called cortical. And this loop structure that you're seeing here called the loop of Henle or nephron loop doesn't extend very deep into the medulla. About 15 to 20 percent of your nephrons are the kind that are called juxtamedullary. And juxtamedullary, they have very long loops of Henle. They extend deep into the medulla of the kidney. It's unfortunate in some respects, that most of our nephrons are of the cortical variety. What do I mean by that? Some animals, much smaller than us, their kidneys have mostly juxtamedullary nephrons. And animals that have mostly juxtamedullary nephrons can drink seawater with impunity meaning they can drink seawater and have no consequence. Animals say, like the kangaroo rat, desert tortoises. Now, they're not, they're not next to seawater, of course not, but what I mean is because they have juxtamedullary nephrons, a lot of them, they can concentrate their urine much, much greater than we can. And because of that ability, they can drink water that is very, very saline, a lot of salt, and not have any consequences. We can't drink seawater. I'm sure most of you know that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, most of you inherently knew you shouldn't drink seawater if you were lost at sea. It's not good for you. Well, I will briefly tell you why you can't do that, um, mostly because it's a losing battle. You will lose more water than what you consumed, than what you drank from the ocean. If we had more juxtamedullary nephrons, like the kangaroo rat, like desert tortoises, or other animals that live in extreme conditions where water is scarce, we would be able to drink seawater. But Sadly, we have mostly cortical nephrons. It's the length of the loop of Henle where we get our concentrating power to make the most concentrated urine we can, like possible, the most we can. Um, again, I'll talk about that when we get to the loop of Henle in more detail. So you have roughly about a million nephrons in each kidney. They are post-mitotic. The reason why you are in early stage renal failure if you're age 30 um, is because at age 30, some of your nephrons start to die. You lose them and you don't grow them back. So for every decade after age 30, you roughly have 10% of your nephrons dying. If that doesn't convince you to take care of your kidneys, I don't know what will. The nephron has, a, um, has different structures to it. Um, one part of the nephron is called the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle has two parts to it. It has the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. In some books, they call the glomerular capsule Bowman's capsule. We're not supposed to call it a person's name these days, but you're gonna, you're probably going to read both terms in your homework packet. Uh, so I just want you to be available, or not available, but be aware of that. So over here is a renal corpuscle. 
that I'm highlighting in green. It's basically the glomerulus with the mushroom cap over it. That's the renal corpuscle. The glomerular capsule is where the filtrate is captured. I think it looks like a catcher's mitt. So Bowman's capsule, glomerular capsule, this is where the filtrate is first collected as it's filtered through the fenestrations of the glomerulus. Then we actually get to the uriniferous tubule and it has the following structures. PCT stands for proximal convoluted tubule. Then we actually have the nephron loop, this uh, downward limb, a hairpin turn, and then an upward limb that I'll talk about. We then also have a distal convoluted tubule. And then the distal convoluted tubule leads to a structure called the collecting collecting tubule, collecting duct, collecting ducts lead to um, uh, medullary ducts, leads to papillary ducts. Once you get to the ducts, they are no longer part of a nephron, but we learn about them because the nephron leads to them. So let's first talk about the renal corpuscle. Here we see <clears throat> the larger artery leading to the glomerulus is the afferent arterial. The glomerulus is found here. It is a modified capillary bed. It has fenestrations. It's a lot like a colander or a sieve. When you make pasta and you strain the water out, you use a strainer, right? So those holes in your strainer, um, the glomerulus has holes through the cell membrane and those are called fenestrations. So it's porous. The afferent arterial leading to the glomerulus and then blood that's not filtered exits through the smaller efferent arterial. The efferent arterial being smaller is an advantage to us because it's smaller, it sort of acts like a bottleneck and it doesn't let the blood drain out of the glomerulus as readily. It kind of dams the blood up, sort of like someone kinking a hose. And when the blood dams up in the glomerulus, this gives the kidneys more opportunity to filter the plasma and help get rid of those waste products I told you about. The the physiology of the glomerulus is strikingly different than any other capillary in your body. This is truly a specialized capillary. Um, it has anatomy so that it can filter your plasma very quickly and many times a day. And if the glomerulus and the structures that are associated with it called the filtration membrane, if they are damaged, you cannot filter your blood as well. What can damage your glomeruli and filtration membrane that I'll tell you about in the next slide? Things like chronically high blood pressure. We don't mess around with someone who has high blood pressure. It needs to be managed. And if we don't manage it, if they don't manage it, if they don't get on medications and alter their diet, their, their glomeruli will die. And if the glomeruli die, blood flow to the nephron is compromised, and that means those cells will also die. The person is going to invite a more rapid renal failure mechanism. That is called um, hypertensive nephropathy. Uh, pathy means pathological, nephro, ne nephro, nephropathy, pathological changes to the nephron. So we don't mess around with that. Another way a person can have damage to their filtration membrane is if they are diabetic and they don't control their diabetes. This will also impair the glomerulus and the filtration membrane. This will lead to death, the glomeruli, and the nephron. <clears throat> and this is called diabetic nephropathy. So filtration membrane up close. 
what does it look like? It consists of three things. The filtration membrane consists of the simple squamous endothelium of the glomerulus. And you can see the little holes there. Those are the fenestrations going through the cell membrane. Then there is a different cell, a different cell called a, a podocyte. And this podocyte, podo meaning feet, it's got these little extensions of it. They look like little feet. And then the feet get even more smaller, and those are called pedicels. So this is called a podocyte. Here's the nucleus of the podocyte. And to me, it kind of looks like an octopus with all of its feet kind of enveloping around the capillary called the glomerulus. In between those two cells, the simple squamous endothelium and the podocytes, which are actually simple squamous epithelium, basically, in between them, in between them, we have this basement membrane and <clears throat> the, the basement membrane is a sheet of protein. And a lot of times students think that the reason why proteins from your plasma aren't filtered into the filtrate, they think, they think it's because of those fenestrations, those holes, right? Your pasta typically doesn't go through the holes of your, of your strainer. Why? the pasta is usually too big, right? That's why it doesn't go through. So students think that our plasma proteins, the reason why they don't get filtered is because they're so big, they can't fit through the fenestrations. Not, that is actually a secondary, a secondary reason why some, some plasma proteins don't get filtered. The primary reason why plasma proteins don't get filtered um, is because of that basement membrane, that sheet of protein. You see, most of your plasma proteins are in fact small enough to get through the fenestrations. But why don't they then get through the fenestrations and through the little slits in between the pedicels called filtration slits into Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule, the catcher's mitt. Why don't they? Plasma proteins and the proteins in this basement membrane um, are negatively charged in your body. And things that are charged the same repel each other. Perhaps you've taken a physics course and you were taught opposites attract, opposite charges attract each other, but same charges repel. So this basement membrane being mostly protein, proteins that are negatively charged, repel the plasma proteins that are also negatively charged. That is the number one reason why plasma proteins are not filtered. It's not size exclusion. It's a charge, same charge repulsion. If someone has uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled high blood pressure, you will damage that basement membrane. And when it is damaged and compromised, then those plasma proteins will get through the fenestrations will get through that basement membrane because it's being destroyed and will end up into the glomerular capsule. The rest of the nephron does not have robust machinery, cell membrane transport to reclaim those proteins that came from your plasma and are now in your filtrate. And if the nephron cannot reclaim then guess where it's going to end up? In the toilet. And when a patient has a lot of protein in their urine, that is a no-no. That's called proteinuria. Having protein in your urine 
you know, beyond trace amounts uh, is not good. It is screaming to your physician. You've got something compromised in your kidneys and it's likely this basement membrane. Autoimmune disorders can also attack the basement membrane. So there are a myriad of reasons why this filtration membrane can become compromised. It's a very important structure. Okay, so we just went over the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle, I'm highlighting in blue, is the glomerular capsule over the glomerulus. This is where filtration occurs. So production of filtrate. As the filtrate goes through this wiggly structure, that's called the proximal convoluted tubule. The cells of the proximal convoluted tubule, they're very busy and they're using membrane transport to pull precious things from the filtrate and put it back into the blood. And they can do this because right on the other side of them is the peritubular capillary bed. So that blood vessel is right there. So they reach in, they use membrane transport, things like um, endocytosis. We learned about this in our first week of school. They use simple diffusion. They use facilitated diffusion. They use primary and secondary active transport. These are all things that we learned in the first week of school. So these cells are so busy reclaiming, reabsorbing precious materials and putting it back in the blood. They are also reaching into the blood because the peritubular capillary bed is right there, right next to them, and they are putting waste molecules that might have escaped filtration. And they're reaching back going, ah, you thought you got away. We're not having it. You are waste. You need to go. So they can reach and put into the filtrate. And when they do that, that's called secretion. So in the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, we see a lot of reabsorption, but also secretion. Those two processes are happening robustly in the proximal convoluted tubule. It is a very hard working part of the nephron. 100% of your filtered glucose is reclaimed and put back in the blood. Any amino acids that have been filtered, reclaimed, put back in the blood, precious things, water, most, most of your water, um, about um, 80% 80, 80 of your filtered water is reabsorbed at this point. Um, about, sorry, not 80%, strike that. About 65% of your water is reabsorbed at that point and about 68% of your salts like sodium and potassium are reabsorbed at this point. Then this structure that you are seeing here, this loop has a descending limb, a hairpin turn, and then an ascending limb. All of that together, all three structures are part of the nephron loop, also known as the loop of Henle. Again, we're not supposed to call things by the name of the, the anatomist that studied them. Um, so nephron loop or loop of Henle. Descending limb, hairpin turn, ascending limb. The physiology of the descending limb, hairpin turn, and ascending limb, very different. Each portion, very very different. Um, and I'm going to go through the different parts of the loop of Henle, nephron loop, in the next slide. After the loop of Henle, and by the way, the ascending limb has two parts, has a thin part and a thick part. So after the ascending limb, we then have another squiggly part that I'm highlighting here in blue called the distal convoluted tubule. Or DCT. And in the distal convoluted tubule, we still have some reabsorption. It says here that it's variable. 
Why is it variable? It depends on the hormones that are around, telling the nephron how to modify itself. It also is another place where we see secretion. And then we finally get to the collecting system. Remember, that's technically not part of the nephron, so it's colored differently on this slide. We get to connecting tubules, collecting tubules, leading to the collecting duct, medullary duct, which is not shown here, but that would be medullary duct, leading to the papillary duct. Um, and the physiology of all these structures is also amazing. They are going to respond, again, to hormones. So these structures are going to respond to a hormone called ADH, in particular, antidiuretic hormone, particularly when you are dehydrated. So when you need more water retained in your body and not urinate as much, this collecting system is, is your water savior. So PCT, just to say it again, this is the primary site for reabsorption and secretion. What is reabsorbed? Precious materials, water, salts, glucose, amino acids. It's also a very primary site for secretion. What's being secreted? Acids, um, acids like hydrogen. Um, other acids can be secreted as well, um, something that we call fixed acids, so don't, don't worry about that. Going to the loop of Henle now, the loop of Henle, again, has a few parts to it. It's got a descending limb, hairpin turn, and an ascending limb. And the ascending limb can be further divided into two sections, a thin ascending limb and a thick. Most cells of the nephron are going to be simple cub cuboidal. Most, not all. In certain regions of the nephron, we're going to see simple epithelium. We saw simple epithelium in the glomerular capsule, where I told you about the podocytes. Those were simple epithelial cells. The descending limb of the loop of Henle the descending limb is simple squamous as well. The hairpin turn is still simple squamous. The thin ascending, the thin ascending sec, a section of the um, ascending limb is also simple squamous. Anything that's called thin is going to be simple squamous. The thick ascending limb we're going to see a return to simple cuboidal and to return to our unit, not unit four, but um, chapter four, where you learned about tissues. When we see epithelium that is cuboidal, <clears throat> we start to think of more surface area for membrane transport. So the nephron at the proximal convoluted tubule the thick ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule, all of the collecting system, those cells are basically going to be primarily simple cuboidal epithelium, where they have more surface area for me more membrane transport, grabbing precious resources and secreting more waste. In the <clears throat> loop of Henle, the descending limb, so the down, the filter is going down towards the hairpin turn. What is happening? That descending limb is reabsorbing water only. It is collecting water. It's extracting the water from your filtrate. If in the PCT, you reabsorbed 65% of the water that was filtered, the descending limb 
reabsorbs another 20%. So that means by the time your filtrate gets to the hairpin turn, your nephron has already reabsorbed 85% of the water and put it right back into the peritubular capillary bed. And that's not under hormonal control. That's just status quo. The remaining 15% of water that is left over in the filtrate, how much more can be reabsorbed of that? Well, you can't reabsorb all of the filtered water. And I'll explain why in just a moment. But you can reabsorb um, about 5% more-ish. You can't reabsorb all of the water from your filtrate because you're trying to get rid of, rid of waste. And just like when you flush your toilet to get rid of the waste in your toilet, water helps flush it away, right? So you, if you're trying to get rid of waste products out of your body, there is something called obligatory water loss. You're obligated to lose that water. None of you have flushing toilets where it just uses air to flush your toilet. It, it uses water, right? And some of you might have a toilet where you can actually flush using two different buttons. Let's say if you only pee into the bowl of your toilet, you can select the button where it doesn't use as much water, right? It doesn't take as much water to flush down liquid waste. But when you defecate and you have more solid matter, you were probably are going to select the other button where more water is needed to help flush that solid mass down into the drain. And then some people have a low flow toilet where you don't have this option. Have you ever gone poo in someone's low flow toilet? Why do they have a low flow toilet? To save water. Is the irony lost on you that when you poo into a low flow toilet, you frequently have to flush many times to get that solid mass down. So that is a similar concept to our kidneys. If you have a lot of waste in the filtrate, you are obligated to lose more water to flush that out of your system. And I'm gonna come back to that and explain to you exactly why, based on that obligatory water loss, if you drink seawater, you are ingesting more waste products. And you will be obligated to lose more water. And that's why I said earlier, drinking seawater is a losing game. You will become more dehydrated than the water you ingest. You will die. In just a moment, I will also teach you why Bear Grylls is an idiot when it comes to uh, teaching us lessons on survival me mechanisms. There are many episodes where we see him peeing into his canteen and drinking his urine. Okay, I will, if you want me to, I can mathematically prove to you why that also is not wise. It's not as bad as drinking seawater, but it is also a losing game. You won't dehydrate as quickly as you will from drinking seawater, but drinking your urine, you will over time dehydrate yourself more than rehydrate. He's an idiot for telling us to do that, quite frankly, and I can prove it. I still find them highly entertaining just to, just to be able to say, uh, that's bullshit. <laughs> we shouldn't do that. I particularly like the one where he picked up the elephant dung and squeezed the water out of the elephant poo into his mouth. 
No, <laughs> no, we don't do that. No. After the loop of Henley, after we go from the descending limb to the hairpin turn to the ascending limb to the thick ascending limb, the thick ascending limb, its job is to reabsorb more sodium, potassium, and chloride. So it focuses on reabsorbing salts. Then we get into the, the distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule has two parts to it. There's an early and a late. Early means it's more proximal to the beginning of the nephron, you know, Bowman's capsule. Late means it's more distal, it's further away as you travel from Bowman's capsule through the hairpin turn. It's, it's later, so that's why we call it late, it's distal. In textbooks, they frequently show the nephron as a two-dimensional structure like this, where they show Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb, hairpin turn, ascending thin limb, thick ascending limb, early distal convoluted tubule, late distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting system. It is not a left to right structure like it shows in this picture. It is actually a 3D structure and it's twisted around itself like a rubber band that's been twisted. So, the afferent and efferent arterial. Think of them, here's my afferent. Think of my hand as the glomerulus and here's the efferent arterial, okay? So afferent, glomerulus, efferent. Bowman's capsule is a course around that. Then you've got the, the nephron. Well, the early distal convoluted tubule Actually, I know this looks perverted, but the early distal convoluted tubule goes right in between the afferent and efferent arterial. It is a functional contact. And that's shown here, right here. So here's our afferent. And here's our efferent. And right in the middle is our early distal convoluted tubule. This functional contact is extremely important. And the cells that are found in this contact are communicating to each other in real time. They are sending chemical signals. This entire structure is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Every student in anatomy is asked about the parts of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. It consists of juxtaglomerular cells. These are cells around the afferent and efferent arterial. They are found mostly around the afferent. So I'm gonna draw them in. These juxtaglomerular cells would be found around the afferent arterial and a little bit around the efferent. Their job is to monitor how much blood is arriving in the afferent arterial and how much blood is leaving the efferent. These cells, these juxtaglomerular cells, are, they are sensitive to stretch. If more blood is arriving, they detect more stretch. They act a lot like our baroreceptors that we've already learned about. It is the kidney's way of measuring how much blood is coming to the kidney so it can do its job. Remember I said it takes its job very seriously. And it has these juxtaglomerular cells there to monitor blood flow. Again, they're a lot like the baroreceptor cells we learned in a previous unit. So they are there. Then there are cells <clears throat> inside, inside the early distal convoluted tubule. And those cells 
are called macula densa cells. And their job is to taste, they drink, the filtrate. And the filtrate, at this point, most of the water and most of the salt has already been reclaimed and put back into the bloodstream. So these cells are drinking and they're measuring the saltiness of the filtrate. And if there isn't enough salt in the filtrate, they signal, they signal to the afferent and efferent arterial. And those arterials can vasodilate or constrict to help bring more blood to the glomerulus and dam it up so that you get more filtration. It is the early distal convoluted tubule with the afferent and efferent arterial with the juxtaglomerular cells and the macula densa cells that help adjust your filtration rate. They help adjust it on a moment to moment basis. And that's very advantage, that's a, a, a advantageous to us. It's an advantage to us because let's say you go to the gym and you start working out. Well, your blood pressure goes up. Of course, we know that, right? You start moving, you get more blood circulating, you get vasoconstriction to blood vessels that are serving organs that you're not working out. So <clears throat> if you were at the gym working out and your blood pressure goes up, you would filter more of your plasma and within 10 minutes of your workout, you would have so much urine production, you'd probably die because your blood volume would be depleted. So it's this apparatus that helps adjust when your blood pressure changes. <clears throat> Arguably, when you have sex, your blood pressure goes up. Um, that would be very awkward if five minutes into having sex, you're saying, excuse me, I have to go pee like a racehorse right now. Um, talk about coitus interruptus. That would not be convenient. So this apparatus helps to adjust filtration rate. There are five parts to this juxtaglomerular apparatus. There is one, the afferent arterial. Two, the efferent arterial. Three, the juxtaglomerular cells around both the afferent and efferent arterial, mostly found around the afferent. Four, the macula densa cells within the early distal convoluted tubule. So that's five. Those are the five components of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. When you get to physiology, and if you take pathophysiology, you learn more about a sixth component called mesangial cells. So if your textbook, depending on the one you're using, addresses these, you do not need to worry about them for anatomy. Um, it's not that they aren't cool, it's just that the big five that I've listed here is our primary focus for anatomy students. This juxtaglomerular apparatus that regulates your GFR, <clears throat> those juxtaglomerular cells that are around the afferent and efferent arterial are also called granular cells. So again, depending on your textbook, I'm just writing down another term. You know, it's my joke, Nancy. There are <coughs> two names for everything except for when there's seven, All right? There's, there's always another term. So if your book says granular cells, it's another term for juxtaglomerular cells. The juxtaglomerular cells 
put up the help sign, like help, this, this is not okay. Again, the kidneys take their job seriously. If you want them to filter your blood, you need to get blood to them. If you have reduced blood volume, you will have reduced blood pressure. Let's say you've had a bad hemorrhage. Your juxtaglomerular cells will not detect as much stretch. They'll detect less because you have less blood volume and pressure. When they detect less stretch, they send out the distress signal. And the distress signal is they secrete an enzyme called renin. That's how we say it, renin. Do not say renin. Renin is spelled differently. Renin is spelled with two N's. <clears throat> and renin is an enzyme to curdle milk. We are not talking about making cottage cheese. So it is not, we do not say renin, it's renin. So renin is now released into your bloodstream. And there is a protein in your bloodstream made by the liver. It's there all the time. And it's called angiotensinogen. And as I told you on Monday, when we learned about digestive enzymes, if a protein ends with the suffix ogen, it tells you that it is a protein made in a precursor term or precursor form, and it needs to be activated. So when renin is released, it cuts angiotensinogen into two parts. And angiotensinogen is not a very big protein. It's actually only about 12 amino acids long. Renin cuts it into two parts, and one of those parts is called angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 1 travels throughout your entire body in your bloodstream. And when it gets to, of all places, when it travels to your pulmonary capillary beds, there is an enzyme in the pulmonary capillary bed. Again, this is in your lungs, right? And this enzyme is called ACE. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. And this is the reason why in physiology, uh, this communication between the kidneys and the lungs, we say that the kidneys and the lungs are like best friends in the body. They are constantly communicating to each other. It's weird to think that these two very seemingly different systems are in constant contact with each other. They are truly BFFs. Um, so there's much more to this story, but this is the beginning part that I do need you to know this communication system. It starts with the juxtaglomerular apparatus. It leads to angiotensin one being cut into two parts. And one of those parts is called angiotensin two. This system is called the RAA mechanism. Some textbooks add another A, and I'll explain why in just a moment. So the R stands for renin. The first A stands for angiotensin II. The second A stands for aldosterone, a hormone I will tell you more about. So aldosterone is going to tell the kidney to reabsorb more salt and water. Why would this be helpful? As I told you at the beginning, if our blood volume decreases and our blood pressure decreases and it provokes the system into action anyway, the aldosterone will help increase the amount of water and salt retained in your body. That will help your blood volume and pressure. The third A that some textbooks are now including 
stands for ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And this hormone, as I will tell you in just a little bit, also helps or tells the nephron to reabsorb more water. Again, the end result is your nephron will reabsorb more salt and water, put it back into the bloodstream. This helps your blood volume and pressure. This ensures that the kidneys can keep doing their job. S many people have chronically high blood pressure. And like you heard me say before, <clears throat> we, don't, we don't mess around with that. Um, we give medications. The number one medication prescribed to fight blood pressure goes after this system. People take ACE inhibitors right here. An ACE inhibitor, the medication for that, in case some of you are on it, is lisinopril. And it basically is blocking this RAA mechanism. It blocks this entire cascade of signaling, which means then you don't respond as well to aldosterone and ADH and angiotensin. See, angiotensin causes profound vasoconstriction, which worsens your high blood pressure. So lisinopril is the gold standard for treating chronically high blood pressure. Um, it is not the only system that we can use to fight high blood pressure, but that is usually the medication that most doctors will start a patient on. Uh, usually they might start them out on a 10 milligram per day regimen, it can go up as high as 80 milligrams a day. Again, high blood pressure will damage your kidneys. It is, diet, it is hypertensive nephropathy. You don't want your nephrons to be killed from these high pressures. So we, like I said, we don't mess around with chronically high blood pressure. You're gonna be put on medication. And even if you lose weight and you watch your diet, it might not be enough you might end up being put on lisinopril. Okay, so now after the early distal convoluted tubule, we move into the late distal convoluted tubule. And the late distal convoluted tubule has two different kinds of cuboidal cells. There is a kind called the principal cell and one called the intercalated cell. Um, for testing purposes, I want you to know that the intercalated cell is important for acid base management. You will learn more about how they do that in physiology. For right now, just know that they are important for acid base management. The principal cell is the cell that I want you to know that responds the most to the hormone called aldosterone. Now I'm gonna tell you the truth. The truth is both cells respond to aldosterone and both cells respond to another hormone called ADH. For testing purposes, I want to separate and keep clear boundaries. So the, the intercalated cell, I just want you to know is important for acid-base management because that's its primary job. The principal cell responds the most to aldosterone. That's its primary job. And aldosterone, the way it works is it tells the principal cells, aldosterone is a steroid, and we learned about it when we learned about the adrenal glands. Aldosterone is released by the outer layer of the adrenal glands, the zona glomerulosa. Aldosterone comes into the cell of the principal cell and it tells the principal cell to increase the number of sodium potassium ATPases. I'll remind you from unit one that the sodium potassium ATPase 
kicks out three sodium for every two potassium it brings in. And this is a protein that participates in primary active transport. It uses ATP. The aldosterone also tells the principal cells to create channels on the apical side of the cells. And that's where all the filtrate is. So here's all the filtrate. And it's on its way to the toilet. It will become urine. So this ATPase makes the sodium inside the cell below because it kicks out the sodium out of the cell back into the bloodstream. And because the sodium content is low inside the cell, something we learned in unit one when you learned about muscle contraction, the sodium from the filtrate can actually diffuse through those channels down its concentration gradient into the cell, and then the ATPase kicks it out into the bloodstream. So this is the reason why aldosterone helps your body reabsorb more sodium, maybe at a time when you are on a low sodium diet, for example, or you have a low blood volume. And when the sodium is reabsorbed, water goes with it. Why? Why sodium? Because three are coming in for every three that the ATPase is kicking out back into the blood. But this sodium and water reabsorption comes at a price. The aldosterone also inserts potassium channels on the apical side. And you're seeing potassium secretion. For every two potassium that the ATPase pushes into this principal cell, two leak out. And then again, that's secretion. Because more particles are coming in to the cell than are leaving on the apical side, that is the reason why water follows sodium. That is the reason why aldosterone helps your body reabsorb more sodium and water while paying through secreting potassium. Aldosterone is also very important not just for increasing your salt and water reabsorption, but to get rid of extra potassium. We learned in unit one that potassium levels are supposed to be very low in your bloodstream. If they get too elevated, this can impair excitable cells like your neurons and all types of muscle. We don't mess around with high potassium levels in the bloodstream. That's called hyperkalemia. So aldosterone can be triggered for release through a few mechanisms. And I'm gonna draw upon our endocrine lecture. In our endocrine lecture, you were told that a hormone can be released through a neural mechanism, a hormonal mechanism, like when I told you about the HPT pathway, it can also be released in a humoral fashion, something in the blood. Aldosterone is triggered for release through a humoral mechanism. It's triggered for release either through the RAA pathway, and again, renin would be released into the blood. It can be released because of high potassium levels in your blood, something called hyperkalemia. It can also be triggered for release if you don't have enough sodium in your blood or water, you're dehydrated, your blood volume and pressure are low. Those are the three main reasons why aldosterone is triggered for release from your adrenal cortex. ADH is another hormone that I've been talking about. It stands for antidiuretic hormone. ADH is released in a um, neural mechanism, but also from a humoral. ADH can be released from the RAA mechanism. 
It also can be released from, as a neural mechanism, right? Ultimately, that's how it's released because we see the, the hypothalamic axons extending into the posterior pituitary and those, ter those terminal uh, boutons, the nerve endings that are found there, release ADH. The number one, the number one reason why ADH is triggered for release is because of your blood osmolality. Um, another way to say that, osmol, osmol, lal, itty. Another way of saying that is if your blood is too salty, that's the number one trigger to re have your brain release ADH. And when your brain releases ADH, um, your hypothalamus will also trigger a thirst response in you. So when ADH is released, it tells the collecting system to become more permeable to water. Without ADH, the collecting system is impermeable to water. So they insert these aquaporins through the cell membrane only when ADH is around. And when ADH is around, then that means the aquaporins are there and the water can be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So that's the water permeability being triggered by ADH. If you reabsorb more water, you will dilute the saltiness of your blood and that will reduce the blood osmolality back to a normal value. Um, when people go in for surgery, frequently they are deprived of food or water for what, about 12 hours? <clears throat> and if they are having surgery and they have general anesthesia, when they wake up from that, not only are they thirsty because they've been deprived of water for probably now over a day, they are also thirsty because some anesthesias also um, trigger a thirst response. So it's not uncommon for someone waking up from surgery to be begging for water because that hypothalamus is releasing ADH, trying to reabsorb water from the collecting system but also provoking this thirst response. And it can be very, very powerful. Have you ever been so thirsty where all you could think about was getting your hands on some water? It's, it's almost enough to cause a panic attack in you and you, you feel it in your core how thirsty you are. It is, it is a kind of torture that some people use, water deprivation. So, these tubular cells that I was just telling you about, like the collecting tubules, collecting ducts, medullary ducts, papillary, those cells I want you to focus on as being the most responsive to ADH. They are typically impermeable to water. It's not until ADH is around where your aquaporins can be inserted, creating a channel for water to travel through from the filtrate back into your bloodstream. So again, those aquaporins, and that's a fancy word of saying a pore for water, are not present in the collecting system unless ADH is around. <clears throat> Depending on how much ADH is being released, how severe your dehydration is. Remember when we said the PCT you reabsorb 65% of your water and in the descending limb of the loop of Henley, I said we have another 20% and we have 15% then, or eight, sorry, 85% of our water reabsorb, leaving 15% left. You can, under severe circumstances, get another 10%. That's the high end. It's usually around five, but the high end is 10. You still will have to lose, minimally, 5% of your filtered water. That is obligatory. It's obligatory. You have to have a certain amount of water to flush the waste out of your system. 
think of your nephrons as a toilet. They, it requires a certain amount of water to get rid of the waste. So <clears throat> let me just quickly tell you something kind of fun. Um, why, um, why Bear Grylls is kind of an idiot. Um, first of all, there is a, a short story. It's really supposed to be more of a poem called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Maybe you read this when you were in high school. Um, in, that, in that book, there is a part that says, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. And it's a story of this sailor that experienced a lot of hard times on one of his recent adventures when they were sailing across the ocean. They got stuck in a section of the ocean where there are doldrums. And doldrums are where you don't have enough oceanic currents nor winds to carry the ship and inflate the sails. So if the sailors back in the day before they had motorized engines, if they got stuck, if their ship got stuck in the doldrums, they could just sit there bobbing in the ocean for days, weeks, until a storm happened to pick up the sails. So that happened in this story, and they went through all of their provisions. They went through all of their drinking water, and that's why the author wrote, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. And that was to portray that the sailors knew they were surrounded by water, but it's certainly not water that they should drink because it can cause more damage than good. Well, let me prove that to you. Because most of our nephrons have very short loops of Henle. Remember, most of our nephrons are um, cortical nephrons. The maximum we can concentrate our urine is to a saltiness of 1,200 There we go. 1,200 milliosmolal. What does that mean to you? Well, your blood, if you were to taste your blood, you know when you bleed and you're like, kind of put it in your mouth to kind of stop the bleeding, it has a saltiness to it. And your blood typically is 300. So your kidneys have the ability to concentrate your urine four times the saltiness of your blood. So that's the maximum. Okay, so if you are severely dehydrated, um, every day you have 600 waste particles that you have to get rid of every day. That's just from normal cell metabolism. So 600 waste particles per day. If the maximum you can concentrate those particles is 1,200, then that means your obligatory water loss, mandatory, is, sorry, half a liter, 500 milliliters, mandatory. That's roughly the size of, you know, your traditional plastic water bottles, 500 milliliters. That is your obligatory water loss. So if you have to get rid of 600 particles and you're stuck in the doldrums of the ocean, let's say you drink, let's say you drink one liter of seawater. When you drink one liter of seawater, on average, you will consume 2,400 waste particles. Okay? 
So now you've consumed, I mean, because fish poo in the, in the, wa the seawater, you don't think about that. But there's also a lot of salt. So you're ingesting a lot of these salts that your body doesn't need. So you ingest 2,400 and you must also get rid of the 600 your body makes for the day. That means you have 3,000 particles you now have to get rid of. The maximum you can concentrate your urine is 1,200. That means you will lose two and a half liters of water from your body for that one liter of seawater you consumed. Do you see that that is a losing battle? You will become so severely dehydrated. When you become dehydrated that rapidly, that's part of the reason why people start to hallucinate. And when they hallucinate and they think they see land, they jump overboard thinking that they can swim to that land. Kara, you're still muted. Sorry. <laughs> There are different keys you can hit to unmute and mute yourself. And I accidentally hit one. Um, there, um, so there, are, there is a kind of shark that is considered to be the wolves of the sea. And the reason why they're called that is because they swim in packs and they have learned to follow ships because things fall off of ships. And those are usually tasty morsels. So you have a person who drinks seawater, becomes very dehydrated, starts to hallucinate, and they think they see land, and they jump overboard, and the wolves of the sea are there to quickly dispose of them. So do not drink seawater. Now Bear Grylls tells us, Bear Grylls tells us we can drink our urine. And that is a good survival tactic. Go drink your own piece. <laughs> um, let's review the math so that we can have an intelligent conversation with Bear Grylls. When does drinking your own urine become a good idea to you? What situation would you be in? Maybe you decided to go because you're so tired of being in quarantine, you decide when they open the hiking trails, you're gonna go hiking. Now, most of us, when we go for a hike, we bring containers of water, don't we? And we don't anticipate getting lost, but people frequently do. None of us start our hike going, gee, I feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna get lost today. So it's, when the unexpected happens that we get ourselves into some dire straits. So let's say you get lost, you've consumed all of your water, you're still walking around with your empty water container. You start thinking about Bear Grylls and you think, I know, I'll drink my own urine. The moment you start thinking of drinking your own urine, let me tell you, you are going, you are, your body is already producing the most concentrated urine you can make. You're already dehydrated. When you start thinking about drinking your pee, I'm telling you, you're dehydrated. You're pretty desperate. So that means you might be able to collect five, a half a liter, 500 milliliters. And when you collect that 500 milliliters, you are reconsuming the 600 particles of waste your body was getting rid of. Okay? So now you drink that right back into your body. 
and let's say you live another day, you have that 600 of waste from the first day plus 600 more for the new day. And that means you have 1,200 waste particles now. And what's the maximum you can concentrate? 1,200. That half a liter of pee you just drank will cost you one liter of urine. It's a losing battle. You're not dehydrating as quickly as you would if you drank seawater, but it is ultimately a losing game. Right about now is where a student says, hey, Kara, well, what if you started drinking your pee when you were well hydrated? Who the hell does that? Who, who goes on a hike with all their water bottles and says, I'm going to drink all my water before I even start this hike, and I'm going to start collecting my pee so that if I get lost, I have some urine that's more watery later on to drink. No one does that. <laughs> no one does that. So that's my little fun side note, mathematically trying to prove to you why we don't drink our pee. Now, if you have some sort of sick fetish, that's on you. So now we're getting to the bladder. We're finally at the bladder. And the bladder has rugi. Um, where else did we see rugi? In the stomach, right? In the stomach. And the rugi are basically folds that act like the accordion, right? It can stretch. Not only do we see rugi, but we see a type of epithelium called transitional epithelium. And those cells are basically folded like a map, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Not only do the, we have the rugi for stretching, but these transitional cells, transitional epithelium, also allow for more stretching. You can hold a lot of urine in your bladder, a lot. Most of us get the intense sensation to go pee, micturition, when our bladder is usually only about 25% full. I was once on a vacation trip where a man had prostate cancer. And for a man's urethra, part of his urethra, I'll show you on the picture next, goes through the man's prostate. And because he had cancer, his urine couldn't get through the urethra. He had a blockage. He had to be life lighted out of this vacation. I was on a, a floating vacation through the Colorado River, the Grand Canyon. So the helicopter had to come into the canyon and pick him up. And when the paramedics came in this helicopter, they had to insert a catheter into him. And they ended up draining two liters of urine from this man's bladder. He was in so much pain from his bladder being so distended that that was relief for, for him. Uh, his bladder was just moments away from rupturing. So the rugi and the transitional epithelium allow like accordion to expand, but there are limits. So two liters, that's a lot of urine. That's a two liter bottle of soda, if you want to think of that. So um, the bladder not only has this epithelium, but there's also a muscular layer, right? So very similar to our GI tract where we learned about the mucosa. The mucosa has that transitional epithelium. Then we have the submucosa, which is connective tissue. But then we have a muscular layer in the GI tract. We call it the muscularis externi. Um, this muscular layer is called the detrusor muscle. And this is the muscle that contracts when you are empt emptying your bladder and you are peeing, micturition. Then there's a fibrous adventitial layer around it. So here's a picture of the rugi. You can see them. There is a smooth portion that looks like an, an inverted pyramid that's called the, <clears throat> the trigony of your bladder, the smooth region. There are two openings right here 
And that's from the ureters coming in and dripping urine into your bladder. So the two ureter openings are part of the trigony. Again, here is the muscular layer called the detrusor. So that's your muscularis layer. And in this picture, you're seeing the urethra coming off the bladder and going through skeletal muscle of your, of your pelvic bowl. Now for, for females, they have a very short urethra, goes from the bladder through the, the skeletal muscle of the pelvic bowl and then out into the urethral orifice. This is found, your urethra ladies, the orifice for it is found in between your, your labia uh, minora, the small lips, and we'll, we'll learn more about those holes when we get to the reproductive system. Um, I point this out because if we were to look at the female anatomy spread eagle, you would have the clit, which is basically a female's penis. It's the, it's the female's version of a penis. Then you would have the urethral opening. Then you would have the vaginal opening. And then you would have the anal opening. So guys, pay attention here, um, or girls. Uh, get your holes right. Um, the urethra is not meant to be a hole where you ins insert big structures like fingers or a penis. That is not what it's meant for. But um, sadly, um, some couples, back before there was sex ed, um, some couples were infertile for their entire marriage because they didn't know which hole the man's penis should insert. No, I'm not making this up, Sarah. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And some couples were infertile because the man was inserting his penis into the urethral orifice of the woman. Now, first of all, that's going to take some time to stretch or open that much to get. I, mean, I don't care how small the man's penis is. Uh, not to mention lead to a lot of urinary tract infections, but there were some couples back in the day before sex ed where they just did not, because it was improper to look and they didn't know. Um, one, of my, one of my pals from graduate school, Dr. Zhou from China, he came from a very poor part of China and he didn't have sex ed. So when he got married, he told me <laughs> he went to the library and on purpose checked out pornography magazines and books on sex and studied <laughs> the female anatomy so that he would have a better idea of what to do on his wedding night. I think that's adorable. He's a very educated man. <laughs> Men, in striking contrast, have a much longer urethra. They have three parts. They have the part that goes through the man's prostate. Um, funny story, speaking of sex ed, um, my husband had sex ed in high school. My husband also was in college before I met him. He was, he, he was a um, sexual, there was a class, human sexuality, something like that. He was a TA for that class, okay? So when we got married and I had, it was time for my well woman exam, this particular day I said, well, I have an appointment. I have to go see my gynecologist. And he said, you know, after a couple of years of being married, when I would say, I have a doctor's appointment, I'm going to go see, it's my well woman exam. He said to me, and I quote, I don't understand, why, why do you go every year to get your prostate checked? I don't, I don't get mine checked every year. And I, I kind of looked, I said, honey, you need to sit down. <laughs> sit down and let me explain things to you. He really honestly thought I had a prostate and he was a human sexuality TA. 
anyway, so that was interesting. Uh, women don't have prostates. So men do, there's the prostatic urethra, then there's the part that goes through the pelvic bowl, just like women, so that's called the membranous urethra. And then there's the part that actually goes through the man's penis. And there are two names for that. Of course, there's two names for everything. You can either call it the penile urethra or the spongy urethra. And the reason why you can call it the spongy urethra is because it goes through a tube-like structure called the corpus spongiosum. I am telling you about that because when you get your lecture on the reproductive system, you're going to hear me talk about the corpus spongiosum and I'm going to say to you, remember, that's where the penile urethra exits or is, go is traveling through. Um, ladies, are urethra carries urine. That's all that goes through our urethra. But for men, <clears throat> two different kinds of fluid goes through a man's urethra. Urine or ejaculate. Um, not both at the same time. Not both. And we talked about this uh, from a previous unit. A man when he gets an erection, the erection is caused by the parasympathetic division, right? Well, in order to pee, micturition, um, the parasympathetic division is also in charge. So only when you're resting and digesting calm can you pee. It, you know, you kind of have to be relaxed to do that. You have to release that external urethral sphincter. That's the one that you have control over. When a man ejaculates, it is not a parasympathetic, rather it's sympathetic, which is very convenient, right? Because if our mouth is somewhere down there, we definitely appreciate knowing which kind of fluid we should expect at any given moment. Most of us are not okay with getting a mouthful of urine. So um, two different systems are controlling what kind of fluid is being emitted from a man's penis. That concludes our renal system discussion. Um, I'm gonna stop recording.